in the first part of the lecture, we have studied geometric properties of holomorphic functions, in particular, the fact that they preserve angles at each point where the derivative is non-zero. Now we want to study more in detail a particular class of holomorphic transformations, which are called Mabius transformation. So let me introduce them by giving the definition. So a Mabius transformation is a map T of Z, which is given by a fraction. So above we have AZ plus B and below CZ plus D. So it's the quotient between two linear terms. And here A, B, C and D are number such that AD minus BC is different from zero. And then we will say, we give a name to the set of Mabius transformation, we denote by this curly M, the set of Mabius transformations. So before finding the domain of definition of this uh, map T, let me make uh, two brief uh, remarks. So the first remark is about the condition AD minus BC different from zero. So why this condition? So let's let's see what happens when this condition here fails. So for example, we have basically two cases. So if C equal to zero and D is equal to zero, so this violates clearly this condition, then the map T is not even well defined because the denominator is always zero. So then T not well defined. If from zero, so let's say if C is different from zero, but AD is equal to BC, then uh, we can um, find B from this relation. B is AD divided by C. We can substitute it in the formula for T. And what do we find? So we find AZ plus AD divided by C. And below I can already factor C out and I will get Z plus, plus DC. Above now I can factor A out and I get once again Z plus DC. So we see in this case, we get a constant A over C. So this means that this transformation is not very interesting. It's the constant transformation. Therefore, we want to um, ignore it. So uh, this is, uh, it is uh, constant. So not very interesting. And the same uh, computation works also when D is different from zero. So same holds for D different from zero, but AD equal to BC. So also in this case, we get a constant transformation. So it's not very interesting. So this is the first remark. The second remark is about um, the uniqueness of the coefficient A, B, C, and D. So, the uh, transformation T does not uh, identify these coefficients uniquely because T 
entity does not change. If we multiply the coefficients a, b, c, and d by some non-zero complex number lambda. Now this is very easy uh, to see if I now consider lambda a times z plus lambda b divided lambda c z plus lambda d. You see we can factor out lambda above and below. And we get still the same transformation. So this is uh, uh, is saying that uh, if we want, we can always normalize one of the coefficients to be equal to one by multiplying by a suitable uh, lambda. Also, the, these coefficients actually um, have a bit of uh, freedom in the definition of t, which is given by this multiplication by uh, lambda. So this is uh, the second remark. And now I want to uh, study this transformation um, t a bit better by looking at the domain of definition of... Uh, so let me look at domain of definition of t. So here we have we have to distinguish two cases. So the first case is when c equal to zero. In this case, we must have d different from zero and a different from zero. This follows from the condition a d minus b c different from zero. And uh, we have that t of z is equal to a over d times z plus b over d. So in this case, the transformation is called a uh, homotity. So um, t is called a homotity. We will see shortly why. And uh, this transformation is holomorphic on C. So the domain of definition is the entire plane. Um, the derivative of this transformation is constant and equal to A over D. And this constant is different from zero. Now, so we see that T is uh, conformal at every point. So preserves angles at every um, at every point. Why is this called a homotity? Because this is a composition actually of uh, transformation of the plane that you uh, will know um, from uh, Euclidean, uh, from Euclidean uh, geometry. Uh, then uh, we set A over D equal R times E to the I theta. This is the uh, expression in polar coordinates, which is unique because A over D uh, is um, different from, uh, from zero. Then T is the composition of uh, three maps. So the first map is a rotation by angle uh, theta. by angle theta around, around zero. Also, this means that the first transformation sends Z1 to Z2, which is e to the i theta times Z1. Then what I, what I have to do, then I multiply by R, then um, a dilation Um, uh, by a, fact, a factor r um, from the point from the point zero. So the second transformation sends z two to z three 
R times Z2. And the last one is a translation and a translation by the vector B over D. Z4 equal Z3 plus B over D. Okay, this is, um, this is clear because T of Z we have seen is A over D times Z plus B uh, over D. So uh, this means that I take Z, I multiply it by E to the I theta. So I do this rotation. Then I multiply it by R. So I do a dilation. And in the end, I sum B over D. So I do this uh, translation. So, um, so indeed, this is uh, just saying that T is the composition of these three um, of these three um, elementary uh, transformation that you all recall being homotities from, um, from uh, Euclidean uh, geometry. Okay, very good. So um, this is uh, homotity. And uh, maybe the last thing I want to observe is that what happens when Z goes to infinity is that the limit is also infinite. So when Z goes to infinity, T of Z also tends to infinity. So we have this uh, limit. So also the behavior at infinity is clear. Let's see instead what happens uh, when uh, C is different from zero. Then um, in this case, C is called fractional. because basically this means that the denominator is uh, not a constant. So it's a real, um, it's an honest function. So uh, we say that T is uh, fractional in this uh, case. So uh, what happens, so T now is holomorphic, not everywhere we have to uh, get rid of the zeros of the denominators. So it's holomorphic on C uh, minus the point minus D over C, which is exactly where the denominator vanishes. And you can compute the derivative uh, for Z different from this um, singularity. And the derivative is CZ plus D squared. And above we get AD minus BC. Now this is a very short computation, I don't do it, but this tells us that this derivative is also always different from zero. So T is also conformal. Also, we are, it's important always to check the derivative is non-zero to say that something is conformal um, because this is in the hypothesis of the theorem we uh, proved in the first part of the lecture. Okay, very good. So what kind of singularity is um, minus D over C, this is a simple pole. So the point minus D over C is a simple pole. And in particular, if I take now the limit for Z going to this point of T of Z, I will get infinity. Also the, the, the function diverges when I approach this point. On the other hand, what happens uh, when I take the limit for Z going to infinity? Well, this time we have that both numerator and denominator are functions of order uh, one. So uh, we can uh, factor Z out and we get the limit of the quotient A plus B over Z over C plus D over Z. And when Z goes to infinity, this is A over C, which is a, uh, an honest uh, complex uh, number. So in this case, it's not uh, infinity. 
there is a very important example of a fractional uh, transformation that I want to mention here. This is the inversion at zero. So important example. is um, t of z equal zero times z plus one over one plus z plus zero. So you recognize this is a, a Mabius transformation according to the definition, but this is nothing else than one over z. We refer to this as the inversion at zero. So why is this um, uh, important example? because we see that if in the case of fract fractional transformation, we can write this, tra this uh, fractional transformation as a composition of homotities and the inversion at zero. And this is what we want to uh, show uh, now. So this is a proposition one. So if T is fractional, then T is the composition of three maps, T3, T2, where T1 and T3 are homotities. And T2 is inversion at zero. Okay, so let me, let me prove uh, the proposition. So we know that uh, C is different from zero. By remark two, we can assume C is equal to one. This will simplify our computations. We can take C equal to one and then this means that T of Z is equal to A of Z plus B over Z plus D. And now what I want to do, I want to um, make Z plus D appear also at the numerator. To do this, I have to um, sum by AD and obviously also subtract by AD. So now you see I get A times Z plus D plus B minus A D over Z plus D. So um, this implies that uh, we have A because the first uh, C simplifies and then we have this second term B minus A D Z plus D which I can uh, write as A plus, and then I can divide here both numerator and denominator, denominator by B minus AD. And so I get one over B minus AD, Z plus D, B minus AD. Okay, then because we see that the map T is the composition now of this um, T1, T2, and T3. Um, from the formula, we can read off this T1, T2, and T3. So for, um, sense Z1 to Z2 which is equal to one over B minus AD Z plus D B minus AD. So this is a, um, a homotopy. Then I send Z to, to um, one over Z two. So this is the inversion. And now what's left is, is that I have to sum A to what I, uh, I'm getting. So I have a translation by A. So 
the last, so this was uh, Z3 equal to one over Z2, and now the last map sends Z3 to Z4, which is equal to Z3 plus A. And then um, it's, uh, it's, um, it's easy to see that T1, T2, and T3 composed together gives, um, give T, and this is exactly this computation we, uh, we've done, we have done here. So in the end, what we have, uh, we have found here is exactly that the, these three maps, T1, T2, and T3 composed together give you uh, T. So this finishes this finishes the proof. So let me um, sum up what we have. Uh, what we have done, we have considered. Um, we have considered um, homotopies and fractional transformation. They are uh, the two types of Möbius transformations. And uh, we have seen that the first ones are defined on the whole plane, and the second one on the whole plane without a point. And now um, we want to, um, in some sense, uniformize these uh, two cases and consider a Möbius transformation from a um, unitary point of view as a transformation of the Riemann uh, sphere. So this is the third remark. So every maybe a transformation, homotopy or fractional, gives a map from the Riemann sphere to itself. So the Riemann sphere is um, C with the addition of a point at infinity that you can visualize also as a sphere by using the stereographic projection. So you know if this is the, the complex plane and you add a point at infinity, you can see that all this um, can be mapped to a sphere This is the sphere in the this is the sphere in the three dimensional um, space, so it's a two dimensional sphere. And then uh, every point uh, is sent to the complex plane by stereographic projection. So you can think of this C union with the point at infinity as, uh, um, as the Riemann uh, sphere. So this is the Riemann sphere. So how can we define this map? So um, this map has uh, infinity if c is equal to zero. So we are what we are doing actually is we are assigning to the to t of infinity the limit of t when z goes to infinity. So for c equal to zero, this was infinity. And for c different from zero, this was a over c. And what we have to do is to define now the function also at the pole if uh, the, the map was fractional. And in this case, uh, since we have a pole, the function is diverging. So also here we define this to be the limit of t when z goes to minus t over c, and this was also infinity. No? So this is if the um, if the, um, the transformation was fractional. So very good. So in this case, we get now a map from the sphere into itself. And uh, we, we see now that if we um, do this um, extension, it's much more natural to, to think about composition of uh, Möbius transformations because the domain and the image now coincide so we can, you can think now it's very natural to say, to say okay, 
uh, if I have two uh, Mabius transformation, I can just compose one after the other. Since the domain the, and the image are the same, this, is, uh, this works like with um, uh, every um, other function that you know. And in particular, what I want to show you now is that these Mabius transformation are closed under the um, composition operation. In a uh, more abstract term, this means that this uh, set of Mabius transformation is a group. But what we are saying is that if we take two Mabius transformation, we put them together uh, with composition, we still get a Mabius transformation. And that the inverse of a Mabius transformation exists and it's still a Mabius transformation. So let me, let me um, put this in the proportion. So what this proposition says that M is a group under uh, composition of maps. So composition of maps means that if I have T1 and T2, I can associate the composition T1, T2. So what it means to be a group. So now let me just give the, uh, the three properties we want. So the first property is that the identity map belongs to M. So this is the first property. The second property is that if T1 and T2 are Mabius transformations, then the composition is also Mabius transformation. And the last property is that if T is a Mabius transformation, then the inverse of T exists and is still a Mabius transformation. Okay, so we want to show now these uh, three uh, properties. So proof. First, we want to show that the identity belongs. So this is easy. So what is the identity? The identity is tz equal to z, and I can write this as one times z plus zero over zero times z plus one. Now, so this is clearly a Mabius transformation. Then for the composition, we have to do a small uh, computation. So uh, what we want to do is to take t1 compose t2 of z. What does this mean? This means that I have to first do t2 of z and then take this number and, and do t1. So by definition, um, let's call the coefficients of t1 and t2 with a subscript one or two accordingly. So this is a one of t2, t2 of z plus b1 over c1 T2 of Z plus D1. And now we can substitute for T2 of Z uh, the formula. So we get A1 times A2 of Z plus B2, C2 of Z plus D2, then everything plus B1. And below we get C1 times A2 of Z plus B2, C2 of Z plus D2 plus D1. Okay, so now it's only a matter of uh, doing uh, the computation. So what we get above, we get A1, A2 times Z, but we will also get B1 times C2 times Z and we, uh, fraction. So then we get B1 C2 of Z. And then we get the linear, uh, the um, constant term, which is A1 B2. And then we still get D, uh, B1 D2. No, and then at these times one over 
C2Z plus D2. So this is the numerator. So this is the numerator. The denominator um, is C1 A2 plus D1 C2 times Z plus C1 B2 plus D D1 D2. And also this times one over C two Z plus D two, which anyway gets simpli simplified, and so you see we um, we are getting now uh, a new uh, Mabius transformation with coefficient capital A, capital B, capital C, and capital D. And you can easily check that this, uh, this four coefficient still uh, satisfy the, uh, in, um, the inequality A, D minus B, C different from zero because you can easily check that this is A1, D1 minus B1, C1 times A2, D2 minus B2, C2. Since both of these are different from zero, then also the product will be different from zero. So in the end, we have found a new Mabius transformation. Okay, so this was the second point. The last point, we want to show that the inverse of a Mabius transformation exists and is a Mabius transformation. So if we have T of Z, Mabius transformation AZ, plus B over CZ plus D. If we want to find the inverse, we just say, okay, this is equal to some W. And now we solve this equation for Z. Solve um, the equation for Z. So we have this, this equation here. We can solve for, for Z. So this brings us to A Z plus B times, uh, sorry, uh, equal to uh, C Z plus D times W. And now you see that Z from this is equal to uh, D W minus B minus C W plus A. Oh, so this is then still a Mabius transformation. Okay, so we, we, we have found then that this uh, inverse transformation is also uh, of the type above now with new coefficients. So you see these replaced by um, A, A by D and B by minus B and C by minus C. And this is a new uh, maybe a transformation, which is the inverse of the given one. Okay, so this finishes, uh, finishes then the, the proof. And so we understood the first properties of this Mabius transformation, but now we want to uh, look at the geometry in some more details. And the very important fact that we will discover is that this Mabius transformation preserves circles and lines. So let me give a name uh, to the set of circles and lines in the uh, plane. So we have this uh, third part. We will talk about Mabius circles. These are uh, exactly the, by definition, the lines in the plane. We said that C is a Mabius circle. If C is a Euclidean circle or a Euclidean line. 
Okay, so we want just to give a name to uh, circles and lines, like a, give like a common name to them, and we call them Möbius circles. So uh, we can either have a circle in the plane with some center Z0 and radius R, or we could have a line uh, in the plane. Okay, these are the two uh, types of Möbius uh, circles. And we will see now by a very old theorem that you can give a unified description of Möbius circles. So this is a theorem that uh, goes back 2,200 years ago. It's a theorem by Apollonius. Who was um, studying uh, conics. He was one of the first people studying conics in a very deep uh, way, so 2,200 years ago. What uh, did he show? So he gave an equation for Möbius circles. So let's take two points in a complex plane, which are not the same, so they are different, and fix some positive number, k. Then we can consider the set C, which are all the points in the plane satisfying uh, the equation Z minus alpha over Z minus beta, this norm is equal to K. So these are points such that the, the ratio of the two norms of the distance between Z minus alpha and Z minus beta is equal uh, to, um, to K. So, if k is different from one and is a Euclidean line, if k is equal to one. So, in any case, for any k, then positive, this is a, a Mabius. Uh, circle. So, thus, for all k positive, c is a Möbius circle. Okay, so let me give um, the proof of this uh, statement. So, we have here uh, two cases. So, the first case in which k is equal to 1, then the points in C have the same distance from the points alpha and beta, from alpha and beta. So we have uh, alpha here, beta here, and then I want to to consider the points which have the same distance from, from alpha to beta. How can I do this? I can just draw the segment between alpha and beta and then uh, make the perpendicular bisector of this uh, segment. So I take here the, the midpoint and then I go orthogonally and I get here line. This is the uh, orthogonal bisector. This is exactly the set C. So this means C is the perpendicular bisector of the segment A, alpha, and beta. So connecting alpha and beta. In particular, this is a line. So C is a line. Okay, very good. So the first part um, is done. Now, so now let K be uh, different from one. And in this case, to make the computation easier, we will define W equal to Z minus beta. And we will call gamma 
the number the number um, alpha minus beta. And this is a number different from zero because alpha is different from beta. Then what happens? So if we know that Z minus um, Z minus alpha divided by Z minus beta in norm, this is equal to K. Okay, now we, if we make this substitution uh, above, we find that W minus gamma over norm of W is equal to K. What I do now is I, I put norm of W at the numerator and I square everything. So now I get W minus gamma squared and here K squared W squared. Okay, so let me now uh, do the computation for the norm squared at the first, uh, the first term. So this is the norm of W squared minus two times the real part of gamma W conjugate plus norm of gamma squared. Very good, no, so I can now take everything to, uh, to one side and divide by one minus k squared. So this gives me now w squared minus two, the real part of gamma divided by one minus k squared, w bar plus gamma squared, one minus k squared equal to zero. Okay, so now you see the first two terms are um, can be uh, are the first two terms of uh, the uh, norm squared of a difference. What is the, the difference between two points? What are the two points? The two points are W and gamma over one minus k squared. So if we take this nor the difference of W and gamma where one minus, k, one minus K squared and we take the norm squared, then we get exactly these two points, these two terms, um, which I, I, I highlighted in yellow, plus another term, which is the norm of gamma divided by one minus K squared squared. So I have to get rid then of this term. Okay, so now these, these two yellow terms here correspond to the two yellow terms above. I just rewritten them. And then I still have gamma squared one minus K squared equal to zero. So now if I bring everything on the, um, sorry, if I bring the, 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 these last two terms on the other side, what I find is W minus gamma one minus k squared squared equal um, to gamma squared divided by one minus k, one minus k squared, k squared. Right. Okay, so this is exactly now the, um, the equation of a, of a circle. Uh, so this is for the, the va variable W, but now I can substitute back uh, the values of W and gamma. So this is now uh, Z minus uh, beta. So beta plus gamma and gamma was, um, gamma was uh, alpha minus beta, one minus K squared equal to k squared alpha minus beta squared. Okay, so this is a, this is a circle with center beta 
plus alpha minus beta over one minus k squared. You can also rewrite this as, um, as alpha minus k squared beta over one minus k squared, if you like, and radius k times alpha minus beta in norm divided by the uh, divided by one minus k squared in norm. So here I made a small mistake. So if, I, if we go back here, this was squared actually. And then also here, this was uh, squared. Okay, so then the radius now is just the square root of uh, uh, this uh, number here. And this is k times alpha minus beta in norm divided by one minus k squared in norm. Okay, so this is a circle. So we have uh, then finished our, our proof for this second case. So this was the characterization of circles and lines given by Apollonius. Um, now, um, characterization is useful because using this characterization, we can show that Mabius transformations preserve Mabius circles. So this is, uh, theorem with which we want to uh, conclude this uh, lecture. So maybe it's transformations preserve maybe circles. So very good. So here we make case distinction. So if T is homotety, then we know from uh, standard Euclidean geometry or from the characterization of T as the composition of uh, translation, um, dilations and rotations that T uh, sends circles to circles So Euclidean circles, Euclidean circles, Euclidean circles, and Euclidean lines to Euclidean lines. So this case uh, is clear. So in particular, maybe circles, circle will be sent uh, to a maybe circle. So now the interesting part is when T is fractional, then by proposition, um, by proposition one, we know that T is the composition of T3, T2, and T1. This was proposition one. where T1, T3 are homotities. And T2 of Z is the inversion. But we know already that T1 and T3 send uh, maybe circles to maybe circles. So since T1, T3 preserve maybe circles, So here, once again, preserve means, maybe I, I can just add it here. So this means um, uh, if T is a Mabius transformation and C is a Mabius circle, then T of C is a Mabius circle. So it doesn't have to be the same Mabius circle. So doesn't have to, C doesn't have to be equal to T or C. It's another Mabius circle but still uh, is a maybe a circle. Okay, so we know now that T2, T1 and T3 are homotities, so they preserve maybe circles. So it's enough to check uh, to conclude that T preserves maybe circles. So since T1 and T3 preserve maybe circles, is enough 
to check that T2 preserves Mabius circles to conclude that T preserves Mabius circles. Right, so what we have to, to do, so let, let's see the uh, Mabius circle. So this means that um, uh, Z in C, if and only if um, Z minus alpha over Z minus beta equal to K. Now I want to apply um, the transformation one over Z. And therefore Z, so now if I know that um, W is one over Z in the new coordinates. This means that Z is also one over W in the old coordinates. So these two things together, these two things tell me that instead of Z, I can write one over W. So one over W minus alpha, over one over W minus beta is equal to K. And uh, getting rid of uh, denominators, we get one minus alpha um, W over one minus uh, beta W. Or I can um, write, or I can also rewrite this um, doing a minus uh, everywhere. So this is alpha W minus one. And here below is beta W minus one is equal to K. And now we have basically uh, three uh, cases, which one can handle separately. So the first case is when alpha is different from zero and beta is different from zero. In this case, we can factor alpha over beta out and we get alpha over beta. Here's W minus one over alpha, W minus one over beta equal to K. And so I can now bring this to the other side and I get W minus one over alpha, W one over beta equal to beta over alpha times K. So we see that also in this case, um, in the coordinate W, this is a, a Mabius circles according to the characterization of Apollonius. So this is the first, uh, the first case. The other case is, um, so is the first case. The second and the third case happen when alpha, for example, is equal to zero, but beta is different from zero or alpha different from zero and beta equal to zero. When alpha is equal to zero, what happens uh, is that the numerator is equal to one in the fraction. So we can just write this as W minus one over beta equal to one over norm of beta times K. And we see that also in this case, this is a, um, this is a circle with center one over beta and radius one over norm of beta times K. In the other case, alpha different from zero and, and uh, beta equal to zero, we have similar is W minus one over alpha equal to K over norm of alpha. Yeah, so also in this case, so this is the, the second case and uh, this is the third case. So also in these cases, we get, we get a circle. 
So in all three cases, three cases, T of C is a Möbius circle. So this finishes uh, the proof. So we see that Möbius transformations send Möbius circles to Möbius circles. So let me um, just um, finish with uh, additional information. So an addendum. What is the additional information? So we know that if T is a homotety, then uh, T sends Euclidean circles to Euclidean circles and lines to lines. Now we want to understand a bit better what happens when T is fractional. So let T be fractional and C maybe circle. Uh, let's describe then a bit better what what is uh, better the Mebius circle T of C. Okay, so here we have uh, essentially two cases. So in the first case, minus D over C which is the pole of the fractional transformation is uh, um, an element of C. So this means um, that we have here minus D over C and the circle then will pass through this point, something like this. So this could be the circle C. Now, if we apply D, we know that the image of C is a non-compact, is an unbounded uh, set because the transformation T has limit infinity when T is equal to minus T, when C, when D, uh, when, sorry, when Z is equal to minus D over C. So uh, we can write this here, since the limit for Z going to minus D of C of T of Z is equal to infinity, then C, then T of C is an unbounded set, which implies that T of C must be a line because circles are surely uh, bounded. No? So then T of C is some line in the plane. So very good, so this is the first uh, example. In the second example, minus D over C does not belong to the circle C. So we have here minus D over C and the circle is something like this maybe, or you can imagine also other configurations. So in this case, the image, um, of um, T of C is now a bounded set. So now um, uh, T of C is a bounded set because the limit for Z going to infinity of T of Z is a finite number, it's A over C. So this is, uh, this is a complex number. And this implies that T of C is a, is a bounded set because um, the function um, uh, T is bounded on sets which are um, away from minus D over C. And Therefore, if C is um, contained in, a neighbor, in uh, the complement of a small ball around minus D over C, 
So you can draw the ball here. So this is the ball. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, this is the, the other convention. So this is R here. So radius R and center minus D over C. So if you are in the in the complement of this uh, ball, um, then T of C is uh, bounded. Okay, so in this case, we see that after we apply T, we get a circle. So this is uh, T of C. Okay, so we have uh, the ball is on the circle, then the image will be a line. And when the pole is not on the circle, then the image will be a Euclidean circle. So no matter um, if we started with a Euclidean circle or a, a line. Okay, so we have this uh, more precise information about the image of maybe circles. Okay, thank you very much for your attention and see you at the next lecture.